Hi, Scott. How are you? Hi, Testy. Good to, good to talk to you again. Good to talk to you. It has been a long time that we haven't seen each other. The last time was actually in February in beautiful yeah. Colorado. Yes, I know. It was kind of the last time we could all get together. It really was. It really was one of the last times we could meet and, and yeah, have a good meal and discuss your incredible work, which we will get into right now. So okay. for the people who do not know Scott Smith yet, Scott Smith was running for um, the presidential campaign in 2016, American elections. And uh, he decided to do that because he wrote a book, which is about a new operat operation system for the American economy, which is for him really something really, really powerful and something we can implement today. And um, so he wrote a book about it, which is this one, which I of, of course have. There we go. Oh. There you go. And um, so we're going to talk about your book. We're going to talk about your system, your new financial system. Um, also, you have Grace uh, and honored Professor Borders as being our keynote speaker at our conference at the London School of Economics uh, two years ago. For that, thank you so much again. We were really, really mm -hmm. humbled that you came all the way from Colorado just for two days to speak at our conference. So thank you it so much. It was a pleasure much. to meet all of your friends. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. I, I really am so blessed. So let's get started. So can you tell us a bit more about you, Scott, your life and how, how did you get into American politics in the first place, briefly? And then um, how did you come up with, these, with this new financial operating system for the American economy? Okay, I, I worked, um, I started off working on Wall Street and I was one of the pioneers behind um, the financial technologies that <clears throat> allowed us to do mortgage-backed securities. And so when um, I pioneered that and helped to conceive that, it brought mortgage rates down in half. So in other words, it cut the cost of home ownership in half, and it really boomed the economy in the 90s. And I was just so astounded that um, one person kind of coming up with ideas and championing the, the idea could make such a difference. And then, of course, um, when Wall Street started to take the underwriting behind those mortgage-backed securities and um, getting careless with them and greed came into play, um, the impact on the economy of the crash in 2008 really shocked me too. And I could see how important it is that we have sound economic policies. And so I really began to double down and look at what, what would be the best economic policies to provide the highest standard of living for the, for the citizens in the nation. And I focused on the United States, but much of what I've looked at is equally, equally applicable to um, Europe, um, India, um, Japan, um, China would have to go through some pretty big changes to their economy, but it would work there too, if they were willing to give the freedoms that are necessary. So that was the idea, like, think like an engineer, an engineer, the best economic policies for the American citizen, and don't look at it as being um, liberal or conservative, like what's the best policy? And to my delight, actually, these policies are very appealing to both liberals and conservatives. So when I ran, I ran just to promote the idea. I wasn't, you know, I'm not a known person in the US. So I didn't really think I'd have a, a chance to um, cause a lot of attention, but at least I'd get some attention. And I ran as an independent because um, I found it appealed both to liberals and to conservatives. And indeed, today, both parties, I have good friends in Washington on both parties, and, and the one thing they agree on is we really ought to have the Financial Freedom Act, which is what the proposal is that I'm, that's what it's called, and that's the website for it, is thefinancialfreedomact.com. It's all laid out there in, in the books on that website. Wow, super, super interesting. So 
Um, let me get into the book a little bit more in detail because obviously okay. uh, we have all read it, but the people listening to this have not yet. So um, what the beautiful thing, how you start the book is we are all working together. That's the secret yeah. by Sam Walton. And I think now in times of turbulent times of Corona uh, and also uh, Black Lives Matters and other turbulent times and social unrest and issues the economy is struggling a lot and i think you know um, your system is made to benefit the society as a whole there's really mm -hmm. no one left behind so um mm -hmm. you call it a system upgrade mm -hmm. uh, so and, and i think it was also you who said to me that microsoft and and uh, the windows for example windows was not wrong it was built mm -hmm. at the time we needed it but it's updated mm -hmm. now. And you mm -hmm. were talking about the financial system. Can you tell mm -hmm. us this anecdote and link it to the financial system, the whole, the whole mm -hmm. idea you told me the first time I met you? Because I thought it was so interesting and it made so much sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we don't realize it, but essentially our tax benefits and banking policies are a financial operating system for our economy. And the tax and the banking, um, the fundamentals of that in the United States came about in the year 1913. That's when we created the Federal Reserve and that's when we created income taxes. And so over a hundred years now, we've been living with um, a, a, an operating system that's been relatively the same. And so, the economy changes tremendously. And it's just like if, if you had the original Mac operating system and you bought the latest Mac computer and you put that operating system on that computer and you would think something's wrong with my computer. There's absolutely nothing wrong with your computer. It's the wrong operating system. So now we have all these new technologies um, that we, we didn't even dream of in the 1913s, and yet that financial operating system has not changed. So it's really a simple upgrade to that operating system, and it's one that um, reflects modern technology. And, and once I began to look into what was the impact on technology on our economy, the answers became very clear. Very good. So tell me just uh, before we dive into your into the whole system as such um why did you think that the the u.s economy for example has not come up with a system like the one you're proposing until now what is hmm. holding them back is it lobbying is it something political what can it be because obviously it benefits the society as a whole everyone would benefit so why why is it not there yet? What is holding it back? I think that there wasn't enough pain yet. And um, especially among a lot of the well-to-do people, um, they're living a pretty nice life and it's easy to ignore um, what's happening in the masses out there. Uh, it's easy not to see each other's pain. Um, and you have a lot of momentum. Um, humans are really slow to change. They're slow to see a new paradigm shift until um, often until there's a real crisis. Um, so what's happening with coronavirus and the pandemic now, um, that's precipitated quite a crisis. I don't think that we have our arms around just how big the crisis is yet. And I wouldn't want to guess what's going to happen in the next six months. Mm -hmm. But this has at least got us thinking. And I've found that there's been a lot of outreach in Washington um, to talk to me on podcasts and to have me in conference calls. And, um, you know, I've been talking to people at the Fed and in Congress and on both presidential um, campaigns. Mm, wow. Well, that's, that's really, really impressive. So, um, tell me then a little bit about, well, it, it, I'm really glad that finally your voice is heard. That's first and mm -hmm. foremost, that people have understood we cannot continue the way mm -hmm. it is being dealt with at the moment. So you're in the book, one of your key things, key themes in throughout the whole book is actually 
eliminating income tax. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, income tax was implemented in 1913. And income, and, um, income tax and sales tax and property tax, they, they really all come from our personal or corporate income. And I think um, if, if you were to say the, to the average politician, let's get rid of income tax, sales tax, and property tax, you know, the immediate question is, what's left? You know, other than income, what's left? Because sales tax comes out of spending, retail GDP, but that comes from our income. And so that was the key discovery that I made when I began to really research this. Our income, which is $16 trillion amongst everyone, the wealthy, the poor added together, 16 trillion, represents only one third of 1% of the total economy in the United States. The total size of the economy is measured by the amount of money moving, changing hands each year. That figure is $5,000 trillion. Our income is 16 trillion. So you can completely eliminate income taxes and replace them with a tiny tax on the movement of money. Every time a payment is made, you shave off two tenths of a percent. So for somebody earning $100,000 in the U.S. today, they pay around $45,000 in total taxes, property, sales, and everything. Their taxes would go all the way down to $200, which is just like laughably small. It's just astounding. Um, for somebody earning $30,000, they pay around $6,000 today, and their taxes would go to sixty. dollars So you're going to have the largest tax cut that you've this ever been in legislation and yet two tenths of a percent on every payment not only balances the budget so we don't have that trillion dollar deficit anymore but you can actually pay off the entire national debt in about 10 years time but there's more you're collecting so much money at two tenths of a percent that you can also afford to pay basic income to all adult citizens no matter what they make, of 24000 a year. And you can provide free health care and free college. So this one change in the taxation system balances the budget, pays off the debt, and provides benefits that today we absolutely could not afford those mm -hmm. benefits under our income tax system. For so sure. that's how radical a change this really turns out to be. Yeah, that is really incredible. So you're talking about, you know, erasing debt, um, you call it the banking 2.0. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also you mentioned quite substantially in the part two of your book, why it works. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the economy of exchange, the effect of technology, the original mm -hmm. of government, how mm -hmm. it has all been there and call it the economist's tale. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit more about all of that, please? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I, I majored in philosophy. So what I look at is sort of the philosophy of what economics is. And that was, that was how I actually conceived of this, was going back to the drawing board and saying, what's the government? What's that mean? You know, what is, um, what is taxation? What is the money supply? Where does inflation come from? What is productivity? How does production work? You know, how are they synergistically related? And I would model what I called tiny economies, just with a few people in them. And when you would model that, you would begin to have profound realizations about the realities out there in the economy. And then you could, you knew where to look to find solutions. And so, so that was the background. So talking about the tiny economies then, as you know, yeah. each time I tell people I'm from Luxembourg, yeah, they the, oh, that the tiny, tiny economy. Economy. So would that be, in your opinion, would that be a good case study to test your theory? Yeah, I think so. I, I actually went to an extreme. What I wanted to model was an economy with just three people in it. You know, and then one of them becomes the chief or the president or the king, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's kind of absurdly small, but you have three guys living in a village in the middle of a, of a jungle. 
uh, you know, one produces, say, one's a farmer, one's a hunter, and one's uh, maybe a handyman, you know, and together they can create an economy. And, and so you, when you force it down that small, the question of what's inflation takes on a new meaning. You know, and I found there are really two forms of inflation and, you know, the details aren't as important, but the fundamental principles that came out of it were astounding. And so, um, like, one of the things I discovered was in an economy, you really can't run a national deficit. You know, you can never really spend more than you can afford. And what I mean by that is go back to those three guys. Let's say... They each have their day jobs and they decide they're going to put up a fence around the entire village. Well, it's going to take time, material, resources. And if they have the time, material, and resources, they'll get the fence done, you know. But if they don't, they won't actually be able to build the fence. So that left this huge question. It's like, well, wait a minute. You know, we say there's this huge deficit in our economy each year, yet we build the aircraft carriers and we build the schools and we build the roads we say we're going to build and we provide the food to people. Um, so that deficit is really not that we're spending or doing too much. It's an artificial construct of the financial operating system. And that was what led me to suspect there was a way to solve it. And that's once you really feel like you can solve something, you'll come across something like a payments tax and you realize it's actually really simple to solve this problem. So, um, yeah, it was you as well who mentioned to me about um, what, yeah, it was you. When you, if you want to buy something twice, if you yeah. cannot buy it twice, you do not have enough money. Right, right. Well, and so there's an interesting thing going on with this is banking 2.0. Um, when we buy a house today, we totally take this for granted. We don't think about how absurd it is. But let's say you, you buy a house for $500,000 and you get a loan for that and you pay it off over 30 years, you pay back a million dollars. And so essentially, you've paid the $500,000 to the builder who made that home and you paid an equal amount to the bank who just provided the money. You know, and under our modern system of central banks, we, we literally create our money supply. Um, we create it out of thin air. And if we have a balanced money supply, it makes sense. But if the central bank becomes a source of money, why on earth would you charge interest? Mm -hmm. You know, why would you make a home cost the citizen twice as much as it actually cost? Yeah. So under banking 2.0, that's part of the proposal. And there's a lot of details behind how you can actually make something like that work and not have inflation, um, still have a very competitive environment. But the fact of the matter is our housing costs through financial technology can be less than they are today. And we ought to aim for that because we can have a higher standard of living. A hundred percent. No, I think, I think the system is really, is really, well, there's, there's a pandemic in the, in the financial system, if you want, because mm -hmm. now in Luxembourg, in London, Switzerland, France, the economies mm -hmm. I know about, um, mm -hmm. impossible of someone mm -hmm. in their 20s, even in their 30s, to buy mm -hmm. a home. It's just impossible. It's so expensive. And even, you know, just a small flat, you will need to pay for 15 years on a mortgage to pay it off. And yeah. it's, it's really, I think it, it cannot continue like that. And, and all of these housing bubbles will be the proof of that because That's we're, right. we're heading towards these as well. That's an acid test we're failing right now. Because if technology is supposed to make us more productive and more efficient, it should be easier for subsequent generations to actually buy a house, get some land, build something. And it's been the reverse. And it's, it's like, say, in the 1950s with a starter job and saving a couple of years, you could actually buy some land and build a house. It's what my dad did. 
he had a starter job for sure, junior reporter for a newspaper, and he bought an acre and built a house. When I got out of college, it was a little harder. Now, as my kids are out of college, it's even harder. Back in the 50s, just my dad worked. One person in the family worked. Today, we take it for granted that both members of the house, you know, the husband and wife both have to work. And arguably, we're working like 60 hour weeks instead of 40 as they worked back then. So that was one of the primary questions I wanted to ask. If we had all this new technology and better production, why were we working harder than ever and affording less? And that, that led to this new operating system that I propose because it, it really should work the other way. And we can go into the philosophical problems of what happened with the economy to allow that, but it's, it's not as important as, well, what's the solution? You know, what do we do now and how do we make it better? Absolutely. So um, we're running out of time. I have two questions because it's just okay. so interesting. So one is, what are your next steps? Where are you now with your program, with your new operating system, and how can we help you? Okay, thank you. Um, my next step now is to um, build a series of videos, you know, because I spent my work creating the book and understanding it. Now in the modern times to articulate it, you need a series of two minute videos on every single subject out there. And so I'll have a YouTube channel and I'll populate the website with these videos. And, mm -hmm. and I've got an increasing following on, on Twitter and on LinkedIn. And so I'll continually pump those out. And then I'm also in um, discussions with the policy advisors for both of the presidential candidates. So really does not matter who wins in this election. Um, their key tax and policy advisors really like what this is. So I have high hopes that this will get into mainstream media um, around the middle of 2021. Um, with the pandemic, maybe it happens faster, you know. So I just have to do a lot of, uh, a lot of publicity, grunt work on it, the usual. Well, I will help you with that with pleasure, of course. And also, if you're listening here to Scott Smith and everything you have heard is interesting to you, no matter where you're from, is it from Luxembourg? Is it from England? Is it from the Middle East? Is it from African countries, India, Thailand, wherever you're from? If you're interested, get in touch with Scott Smith over his website or write mm -hmm. me on my social media channels and I make mm -hmm. sure I, I put you through and I send you the website because I think this is a really interesting new concept which we all should be listening to and all of our representatives and politicians because it's in the benefits to all of us to uh, follow lead. So my last question to you, and then I need to let you go because we have already passed way our time, but I could just listen to you forever because it's such, such a hopeful conversation. Yeah. Uh, as a young person myself and single mom of two kids, you know, thinking about buying my own home, but it's just not possible. It's just mm -hmm. too expensive. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you give me hope too with that system mm -hmm. and hope that in my lifetime, it will be available. And if not, the latest for my children. So uh, last question to you then, um, before I let you go short, what inspires you? Is there something you can give to our listeners, to people who are list looking at this right now or later when I put it on YouTube, an anecdote, uh, something you learned, something that inspires you, uh, something that ha you have learned during Corona or during lockdown, whatever it is, what is your gift to our listener right now? I think what inspires me is that um, within all the common people, there's a lot of good. I th um, a lot of good. Um, when I was a kid, my parents did an around the world caravan that we drove around the world in an Airstream trailer. Mm -hmm. And I met people in Iraq, Iran, everywhere. And I was just so impressed by how wonderful people's hearts are. And it's really only le leadership that leads us astray. And I think it's simply because a power and money um, can harden people's hearts. And, and I think leadership is a naturally dangerous thing. And um, we need leaders that begin to realize they're serving people. They're really servants. 
they're not high and mighty people. They're there saying, how do I wash your feet? <laughs> you know, how do I take care of your needs? Mm -hmm. That's what we want. That's what inspires me. Oh, I totally agree with you on that. We have, we have seen and we see continuous examples of leaders who abuse of power mm -hmm. in, in our economies, in our societies. We have it in Luxembourg too. And, mm -hmm. and it's just, I think it's really important to understand that a person is in a position to, to help, as you say, be of service, um, make life and society better for the people they are serving in whatever position they are. Um, and and that, that counts for really everyone. Um, so I think it's just more about collaboration, communication, and yeah. working to, together towards the same goals, really. Um, I think so too. Exactly. I so, agree. Well, thank you so, so much for your time. I love it's talking to you. Easy. This is really interesting. Um, so I will make sure I will share your website and okay. the, the book and everything under the link on the YouTube and your whole bio so people can read up on you. And yeah, if anything, get in touch. Scott is there for you. He's a wonderful man, a great supporter of Professor Borders as well. Just an inspiration to me. I'm blessed to have you as a friend. We will talk a little bit offline, but I will stop the video now. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, we speak soon. Thank you. Thank you.